the VAR show the one place for your weekly football update Hola very warm welcome to the VAR show the show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail so today we are going to have a webinar i think is the eighth webinar of our series and today we have the head coach of Uganda national team Mr Jonathan McKinstry with us we have already done an interview with him if you want to go see that you can go ahead and see that in our options or i'll link it in the description or you'll get a card on top but other than that today uh, due to popular demand we got him back and uh, we are going to have a webinar with we all lot of other football enthusiast coaches everyone will be involved and they last their doubts queries whatever they have and learn whatever or pick up whatever they can from mr jonathan mckinstry so without wasting much time i would like to just directly start off so here we go so okay so now we'll start so we have uh, jonathan mckinstry with us so he is someone whom i personally you know admire because he has at such a young age he has managed so many places so many countries you know and it's like goals for many of them so uh, so i'll just begin one with uh, one question and everyone can follow before i begin like i would ask uh, if jonathan you have anything to say i'm um, just generally you know glad to be sort of with you guys i think um you know football for a long time has been an industry that maybe has has been a bit sort of closed and uh, secretive um when you compare it to other sports for example if you compare it to the likes of rugby in the uk I know people who are involved in professional rugby and even like the American sports NFL and stuff have always been more open to sharing than a lot of people in the football industry but I think hopefully now during this last few months where a lot of people have been engaging and sharing ideas people have seen the benefit of that and you know long may continue so you know happy to sort of come and join you guys and sort of have a conversation and you know ask any questions but also you never know I might have some for you guys along the way so uh, yeah just more than happy to sort of engage and and see what we can come up with of course and like you know I will be having more people I suppose you have more on around, around 10 people joining in but I I think we'll start just start and uh, maybe when they join in we'll ask questions then and for them then So I just wanted to start by asking you, like you know, like uh, Nishan has sent in one question. He of he is here, but he's had some issue with his internet, so he could not uh, come and ask himself. So he has like he wanted to ask, what's the behavior that a uh, that that you see? There is a diff- what's the behavioral difference for a in a player you observe when you when they are representing the country in comparison to when they are representing the a uh, club. So you have managed board. I think you have managed in Bangladesh with Saif. in terms of club and you have managed a lot of countries so what is the big difference according to you i think it's stuck yeah do you have me again sorry there's a huge thunderstorm here at the moment no, no the internet might be a little bit up and down but yeah in terms of just sort of the behaviors um sort of in terms of players in the national team environment compared to the club environment um i think ultimately with a national team i think a coach a head coach has a lot more control than at a club environment um you might think that's a bit sort of interesting but if you think about it at a national team environment players don't have a contract you know they're not contracted to you you know so a player doesn't fit in to what we're trying to do you know if the character maybe isn't what we're looking for for the team dynamic or if you know profile isn't exactly then to make a change at international level because we can move a player in and out relatively quickly whereas at a club level you might have a player who's on a 3 year contract and so you know moving that player out of that environment is, isn't quite so easy and so sometimes there's a little bit there's a difference in the sort of power dynamic you know a player at a club environment especially if he's got a long term contract might feel that he has just more influence 
than than he might do at international level. Um, and and I also, but on the on the flip side of that, I think you know at international level, you've got to remember that almost all of your players are going to be you know, at a high level, you know, they're all coming in and they're all going to be very competitive because you're ultimately picking the best players from from the entire country. Whether it's a nation that all players are domestically based or if it's a country like here in Uganda, who they're coming in at a very competitive level. Whereas at a club, you've got such a range, you've got guys who are maybe just starting their career, who are trying to break into the team. You've got other guys who maybe are on the way down the mountain. You know, they've been top players, but maybe for whatever reason, performance or just robustness has started to fade. And, and it's managing those dynamics within, within the team environment. So I definitely think um, international football, you probably are able to craft the environment that you want in a lot sort of shorter time period than you would at a club environment because and, and a large part of that is because you have complete flexibility on, on player selection, whereas in a club environment, you come in and you know, you've got players maybe on long-term contracts, which you know, can pose a challenge if they're not the right you know, fit for what you're trying to do. Hussain, Rajat, do you have anything you can go ahead like till? Ah, uh, Jonathan, uh, I see a tactical board behind you in the formation of four three three. So I just wanted to know. Uh, so everyone has a coach which uh, we sort of idealize or look up to, or who influences us the most. So who has been the coach which who has influenced you the most? And uh, you can go as deep as you want to go tactically, and uh, in what way is what I want to ask. Yeah, do you know, I think in terms of the influence on my perspective of the game, um, it, it all comes from when I was, you know, even before I was a coach, you know, my, my vision of football, I think, is crafted. You know, I grew up, um, you know, an avid supporter of Newcastle United in sort of the early 90s. Um, my uncle played for them in the early 80s, and so that was sort of a family thing. And, um, and obviously that was at a time when the Kevin Keegan Newcastle United team was around, which, you know, was very direct, very fast break. And quick wide players, the likes of David Ginola, of Keith Gillespie, you know, they had a lead striker all the time, whether that was... And... You know, so that team, I grew up as a, as a young boy watching that team play and, you know, it was an incredibly attacking team and that sort of shaped my vision of the game. And then if you think of the, the other top teams of that era, you know, you had the Manchester United team under Sir Alex Ferguson. You obviously had, you know, a Borussia Dortmund team who first sort of raised their head up in 96 to, to win the European Champions League. Um, and you had like a great Juventus team. Um, we didn't necessarily have like the Barcelona team of that era weren't maybe as what they are now. Like I even remember Newcastle United beating Barcelona. Um, so this whole idea of, you know, pass, you know, the tick attack style football hadn't really developed. And, you know, so for me, that was the football that I really fell in love with when I was young. And, and even now, I think it's the football that gets you excited. You know, it's not the exact same, but you look at the type of football that, you know, the various Red Bull teams around the world are playing, the way Liverpool are playing, um, the way Leicester City under Brendan Rodgers plays. Um, I think these are all teams that are very energetic and they're very aggressive in a technical and tactical sense, not necessarily physically. Um, and, and so for me, that style of football, I've always been drawn towards. I think, um, you know, it's one of the things that I say that maybe people find a little bit controversial, but, you know, I could, I, I can fully appreciate, you know, the Barcelona, the great Barcelona team when, when Pep was their coach. 
but at the same time, it didn't excite me. You know, I completely appreciate how difficult it is to play that brand of football that they played at Barcelona under Guardiola and, and how much work has to go into that, not just at senior level, but through the academy age categories to create that type of playing style. And so, you know, I appreciate it in a huge way. But at the same time, I can't honestly tell you that I was tuning in every weekend to watch Barcelona play during that era. Um, you know, I almost would have preferred, you know, a Real Madrid game because, again, they were very, you know, just the intensity of the play was was significant. But also, I think it's it's maybe even telling that over the years, um, that Guardiola style of football, the application of his play has evolved. Because if you look at the way his Bayern Munich side played and into now his Manchester City side, they are a lot more energetic. They're a lot more aggressive than that Barcelona team were. And so, you know, I think that was maybe unique in the world of football, the way that Barcelona team played. I think a lot of people tried to copy it, but without a great deal of success, because as I said, it's not just about the first 11 to play that style of football. So, you know, I think that just real energetic, let's go forward as quick as possible. Let's get the ball to the feet of our, you know, You know, we've got a fantastically talented team here in Uganda, and we've got some great defenders, great players throughout the team. But our key thing is, look, give the give the ball to the match winners. Give the ball to the guys who can change the game. Um, and, you know, if I look back to when I grew up, that was the same watching that Newcastle team. You know, we wanted the ball at David Ginola's feet. You know, we wanted the ball at Festino Espria's feet um, or Peter Beardsley. Um, you know, these were the guys you wanted to have the ball. And, you know, that's, you're going back 25, 30 years now, but that really has stayed with me in terms of it's what I wanted to see as a supporter. And, you know, I think it's what supporters still want to see, really. Um, uh, I, 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 I completely agree that uh, with you that... Uh, uh, a fast, direct, attacking uh, pace football is is uh, probably much more attractive and even to me as a, a player and coach. But uh, have you as a coach at international level? Uh, of course, you would have. Uh, when you, what, what do you do when you face teams which play a, a low block and just want to uh, uh, defend and they don't give you any space and uh, 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 what do you what do you do then? Sorry, the line broke up a little bit there. So, can you go back to what do you do when when you face teams? That's sort of where it broke up yeah. for me. When you face teams which uh, go deep, low blocks, and do not give you any space, they're happy to just sit back and not do anything. Again, people, the, the, the world of the internet doesn't want me to know what time, a type of team I'm facing here. So we'll try it for a third, uh, a third time lucky. So what type of team are we playing against again? Uh, okay, okay. So my question was simply that if you, uh, for example, uh, a problem with a lot of direct fast attacking teams is, is that they need some space uh, to execute their actions. And a lot of changes that came around 2008 to 2012 was... Uh, after Greece won the World Cup, suddenly a uh, low block, very compact defences became very, very popular. So, uh, for example, I grew up as an Arsenal fan and I loved their counter-attacking. I loved the pace, aggression, speed and quickness of the attack. But suddenly, the era of Greece winning the World Cup and Mourinho coming in and a lot of spaces. So, what I'm saying is that... Uh, when you inter when you on your international duty or your club duty face teams like this, uh, is it difficult for you to adapt uh, to them, or uh, uh, how do you handle those problems? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. The um, and you do come up against those type of teams. You know, I think um, we're very 
fortunate in this current role that with Uganda, I think probably 70% of the games we would play, we would be considered the stronger team in the game. And so when you get that scenario, you do come across teams who will play a low block and will try and restrict the space. I so in December of last year, when we were playing in the, the Sakafa Championship, which is sort of uh, the East African equivalent of SAF, so it's sort of final of that day, Tanzania. And for most of the game, they sat very, very deep. And, you know, they were in largely their, their line of confrontation was maybe 40 meters out from their own goal. They gave us 60% of the field and said, okay, try and break us down. And we and what they were going to try and do was try and play on the counter-attack. And it was very clear then is just our player movement. You know, and this is was factor into everything, you know, rotations and play, you know, so and players covering for each other. And that's maybe why, like, even you go back in the history of the game to maybe the great Holland team, the Netherlands of the 70s, and where sort of the idea of total football was born. But, you know, total football isn't such a dramatic idea. You know, in essence, what Holland were doing was if the space is there for one player to go into and one of his, his teammates for him, and instant sort of revolving positions which even if you look, I think there's a clip on YouTube of it where I think Johan Cruyff is basically at central defense for the Netherlands for four or five minutes because it just never evolves to the point where he gets back into an offensive position. He's filling in for a teammate at central defense. And so in that example against Tanzania last year, we simply, it was a case of executing our our patterns, our movements, um, those rotations all around the field, but constantly looking to go forward. You know, that was the key. It isn't the case that we're going to go side to side, side to side all of the time, because if a team is sitting in in that low block, that's what they want. Because the more, more sidewards passes you play, the chances of you making a mistake, you know, playing a bad pass increase. And so, and then they can catch you out of position and hit you on the counter attack. So for us, it was a case of, you know, constant communication, constant, those routes. Someone, you know, moves out of space to drag a, an opponent with them. Someone else drives in with the ball. But then it also comes into not panicking. Again, I said something. you know, give the ball to the guy and he'll win you the game. And then it um, had maybe only, because of this low block, this compact block, our number nine really wasn't getting into the game because we don't like our number nine to move too much. He's probably one of our more stationary players. Um, we have certain areas we want him in, others that we don't. And because of that, he was being very patient but he wasn't seeing a lot of the ball. Um, and the discussion happened on the sidelines with the coaching staff of, oh, should we change him for someone who's maybe a little bit more dynamic in that position? But, you know, my perspective on it was that if he gets his one chance, he will score. All we need to do is get the ball to him inside the penalty box and give him a good quality opportunity and he'll win the game for us. And ultimately that's what happened. We continued executing our rotations. We kept trying to drag um, Tanzania out, but we were constantly looking to poke and prod at the little gaps that appeared. And eventually it was around, I think the 85th or 86th minute, we got the ball to our lead striker and, you know, he scored. It was his one clear chance of the entire game and he scored the winning goal. So again, it's about being patient with players and knowing their quality and, and just making sure your match winners get the ball 
in areas of the field where they can have influence. Like the worst thing in the world for us to do in that game, in my opinion, would have been to put on a number nine who would have came looking for the ball because then when it gets into the penalty area, he wasn't going to be there to score the winning goal. So, yeah. But I think just constantly always looking for the forward options. Um, I think also making players very aware that direct play doesn't mean aerial play. You know, playing forward in a direct fashion means getting the ball to your match winners as quickly as and effectively as possible. Now, if you talk to your match winners and say to them, well, do you want the ball to your feet or do you want it in the air? Most of them are going to tell you we want it to our feet. And so that has to influence that direct play, that forward play. It's, you know, some people hear direct play and they think it means long ball. But it doesn't. Like, I don't think anyone could accuse Liverpool of being a long ball football team, you know, but they are a direct football team. And so it's the same with the Manchester United team under Alex Ferguson. They were very much a direct football team. The ball went from Peter Schmeichel to Andy Cole in three or four parts. team by any means. Okay. So, you know, like, I, I, I have one follow-up to that, you know, and uh, I think this is, uh, I was reading the book, I think you might have uh, read it, like, Inverting the Pyramid, okay? It's quite, uh, like, in that, I think Graham Taylor, during, when he was at Watford in the 1970s, he said one very good thing, where he said that, if, suppose, someone like Glenn Woodall makes a long pass, or he gives a long ball, then he's termed as a long pass. But if an unfancied player makes that same ball, it'll be a long ball. You know, like, according to you, if you are analyzing a game, how do you analyze whether that post, whether a team played that uh, long ball, which is basically direct, like how you mentioned, like some teams play direct or some teams have only few aspects of the game. How do you, like, uh, like as a, as a team, how do you balance it out? Um, I think when you're analyzing teams, the difference between that long ball or long pass, as you as you rightly called it, um, often comes in what's happening around it. You know, has there been something that has been structured? You know, is something happening on the field of play that has created an opportunity to play that pass? And often, therefore, it is it is designed, it is intentional. Whereas on the other side of it, you know, you have teams who will just look to, you know, play, you know, long balls up to the striker and, you know, play off 50-50s in the air and try and fight for the second ball. So I think really when you're looking at it, you're, you're looking for, is there some sort of structure around this? You know, has there been some sort of development in terms of, of the shape of the team? But also the other thing, you know, you're obviously not analyzing a single moment of a team. You're looking at an entire performance. So if you're starting to see the same thing happen multiple times over, you know, one, two, three, ten games, you can start to understand that, okay, there is a pattern to this. There is an intention behind this type of play. And, um, and yeah, so I, I do think, and it, it, the other thing someone said to me years ago, um, about passing the ball. It's sort of like, you know, some people pass the ball and they give away responsibility. They say, right, that's me finished. It's now your responsibility over there. Whereas other people, when they pass the ball, they accept responsibility because their pass isn't complete until someone has received it in a manner that allows the play to continue effectively. And I always thought that was interesting of, you know, are you a player who's, giving away responsibility when you pass the ball? Or are you a player who's accepting responsibility when you pass the ball in terms of the style of pass, in terms of is it curving inwards or outwards? Is it is your pass helping? Quite a good thing of, um, you know, just even the bet for players, you know, when that ball leaves your foot, are you accepting responsibility for what happens next? Or have you completely given away responsibility? Of course, and you like I just wanted I wanted to I want I had a follow up question to that and just like 
do you think it's just like uh, something which maybe the media coin like a term and there is no difference between the two things that i mentioned or is it similar or what is it like in your opinion long ball and long pass no i i think they are different i think i think along the idea is that uh, i definitely think coaching there is look if if i went in if i was playing against a our side if i for my team frequently unable to um to build in any clear fashion and we would be under a lot of pressure the moment we get the ball then we might be saying okay as soon as we get it we know our number 9 is probably going to be up there on his own in an area of the field so we're going to immediately look to hit that pass and we're asking our number 9 to do his best to try and get on that ball or disturb you know go up challenge make sure the defender doesn't get it all get on it in a comfortable way to come out and try and second ball opportunity you know i think that would be a very clear at least in my mind sort of description of what a long ball is you know whereas a long pass um is much more I think the idea a long ball probably is when we play this it is likely the opposition are going to get it and we are going to try and feed off that whereas a long pass is we are doing this in a fashion in a constructed way that we believe because we know we're in into space we know its position aren't going to be it's just there's more structure to the idea of a long pass than a long ball uh, Jonathan I want to come here uh, uh so you're 35 right now and uh, uh, the number of teams and you've coached would make any budding coach uh a uh, little jealous of what you've achieved uh, uh, by this age what I wanted to ask was what was your first big break and how did you get it uh, in uh, coaching um like i think in terms of the pro game I, i think my first the big opportunity was obviously that first one with sierra leone um and it was very much right time right place you know i think in in football i think in life you sort of you need you need a little bit of luck but also you need to be prepared to take advantage of it you know i don't think people say oh people are lucky to get opportunities but ultimately if you're not prepared for the opportunity when it does arrive then you're not going to get a second chance so i think um but sierra leone i was obviously coaching uh, or the only professional academy in sierra leone at the time i'd been there for 3 years and um the national team job became available the previous swedish coach had suddenly resigned the world cup and sierra leone lost it they had a very slim chance of making it to the world cup and um it was very clear from just the football just community in sierra leone that they were going to appoint a local coach they were going to appoint a sierra leonean coach but as soon as i heard that i thought you know what i believed i was the best coach living in the country at the time and and so i just didn't that I did foreign coach living in Sierra Leone and we basically got in a room together you know I presented what I felt you know I could bring and they gave me the position initially on a three a three game basis and said look we'll they basically had nothing to lose you know it was a case of look we're probably not going to the world cup um here's a coach who's already living in Sierra Leone we don't have to fly him in from Europe we don't have to give him an apartment he already has all of these things and and so it was low risk for them and they gave me the opportunity and we you know we did well and so they extended it the results over those and performances more importantly over that short contract said okay we want to extend into the next african cup of nations and but i'm not so naive to think that if i'd been applying for that job living in london or new york Hey, there was just no way. I needed it was right time, right place. 
But at the same time, once you get in the door, you've got to perform. And so I think, you know, the, the preparation that I'd done for, you know, you've got to remember, I took my first coaching session when I was 16 years old. Um, I sort of knew that I wasn't going to be a pro player. I knew that whilst I was an efficient academy player, I knew that it wasn't, you know, I probably wasn't at the level to make a, a long-term career out of the game as a player. And so I'd been working for 11 years prior to that moment of being the Sierra Leone coach. And, and even getting the job as Sierra Leone coach, you know, 18 months earlier, in my academy, we were doing a class with our academy players. I was sort of leading one of the life skills classes about goal setting and about how you set realistic goals and how you time them and how you work towards them. And so 18 months before taking the Sierra Leone job in front of a class of 15 year olds at our academy, I had put what my career trajectory, what my goals were. And on that board, I had, look, I believe I can become the Sierra Leone coach from this position as academy coach. And so prior, in those years prior to being given the opportunity, I'd been watching the team. I'd been... If I ever get opportunity, this is what I would do with so I didn't have to think about it in the moment. I already had a plan. And so, yes, right time, right place. But equally, I was prepared for the moment. So there's another question on similar theme, and it's sent in by Shir, sir, and he could not be here. So he has asked, like, since you did not have much of a professional career as a player, how difficult was it for you? Or what was the experience coaching at such a young age at such a high level? Um, again, I think when you've not been a player, um, you ultimately, like this isn't true for everybody, but I think for the coaches who have made it to the top level, you know, whether that's Jose Mourinho, whether that's Julius Julian Nagelsmann, you know, all these guys, um, they work extremely hard. You know, they try to refine their thinking. They try to, they don't just accept things for what they are. They, they look at the entirety of a thing, of, of the football environment and go, right, I think that's good. I don't like that. But it's more objective, their thinking. And, um, and ultimately, their preparation for those moments is probably a lot more detailed than if they'd spent their career as a player. You know, I think um, Jose Mourinho said it many years ago when he was, Pardon me. He might have still been Porto manager. And um, they asked him what was the difference between him at sort of uh, these other 36, 37 year olds who've been professional players. And his answer was, well, all of these guys who've been professional players, they've been thinking about the team dynamic for two or three years, whereas he'd been thinking about the team dynamic for 20 years. And so he was like, we might be the same age, but we've been thinking about this job for two decades different um, because when you're a player you're purely thinking about yourself and how can I improve and how can I get my place in the team you're not thinking about the other guys you're having to think about the entirety of, of football a lot in a lot more in depth and so yeah I think you know, that's probably what prepared me for it. And that when, when you, when you stepped out onto that field with the Sierra Leone team for that first game or for that first training session, it was look, we know what we do has quality to it. And we've done this for, it wasn't just me. It was my coaching staff that came in. You know, all of us had, had decades worth of experience of coaching and making mistakes and learning from them. mistakes in the future, but that any mistakes that we make wouldn't be through lack of planning or lack of thinking. And and yeah, you just step out and you deliver it. And, and you know, whatever comes, comes. You know, we sort of knew if this all went wrong, well, then we'd have to go back to the drawing board and start again. But we had confidence that that what we would deliver would be, would be quality. 
and and it proved well. It seems like that proved to be the case. The team re responded well, um, and and we made steady progress. So I have one question which has been sent in by Nishan, and yes, it's more a little bit more tactical. And yes, asked that was the most important or most the key role of a defensive midfielder while playing four three three. When the team is losing by a goal. Okay, so um, it, it's a good question. Um, it's actually a very, very expansive question um, because even for us, and look, for me, the language you use in football is so important. Um, and what I mean by that is what what you're saying what does it actually mean what do the players and the other um, other staff understand what you're saying to mean because people use a whole myriad of terms in football so for example for for what nishan is called the defensive midfielder um we don't call it that here in uganda um, and we actually had a staff meeting about this we said what do we call the player who's playing so i'll just spin around so what do we call this player? Um, and it was very much... It's or termly for that player. It can be the defender. It can be the holding midfielder. Um, in more tick attack teams, it gets called the, piv the pivot. And um, we ultimately call that player the number six. And um, that's what we centered on. Because if you think about it, if I say to you, what is the responsibilities of your defensive midfielder? And then I ask you, what is the responsibilities of your holding midfielder? Your mindset has already changed in terms of what that player's role is within the team. Is he a defensive midfielder? Because a defensive midfielder might be your classic sort of Vinnie Jones, you know, very robust, you know, breaks play. plays, fire passes, maybe even like a Kalmakaleli type, you know, he's there to break things up, to play the he's there to protect the center backs. Um, whereas if you go to the other extreme of that and talk about like a pivot, you know, which is the exact same position on the field, but as soon as you talk about a pivot, you're starting to think more um, uh, Andrea Pirlo. You're thinking, uh, you know, Xavi, Iniesta, these type of guys who now are so different. It's a midfielder. Um, you know, they are now your makers. It's more like being a quarterback of the team. So, yes, they have a responsibility to tackle and win the ball, but also they've got a responsibility to build the play. And, you know, they're maybe trying to play defense splitting passes that maybe a player like Claude McAlelly was never asked to do. So I think it's really important in terms of your game model to say, what do you want from that player? Um, we've changed that rule here in Uganda. When we came in, it was very much a big physical, you know, break up play defensive midfielder. Whereas now it's a lot more of a playmaker. Yes, they have responsibilities of pressing, of breaking up the play, but actually, we pick a much more technical player in that role in our team now. So, uh, Uganda said they've played with a big physical, you know, defensive midfielder. So, you know, it really comes down to what your game model is. Um, but beyond anything, I think across the various roles of that sort of deep line midfielder, I think they need to be really good at reading the game. I think their game intelligence has to be really high. I think that's shared across all of the um, different descriptors you might give to that area of the field because whether it's defensively or whether it's setting up an attack, they've got to see the game. So really, I think the person you're putting in, for me anyway, in that role will have a really high level of game intelligence. But yeah, I think that position is really important to define what it means for your team 
and the language you're going to use revolving not just that rule, but all the rules in your team. Because like I said, if I call that position the defensive midfielder, you and everybody else already has a preconception of what that means. But as soon as I call it the pivot or the num number six, you now start changing your perception of what that means. So language is so important. Jonathan, I want to just come in there. That was a very, uh, uh, very uh, insightful uh, answer that you gave. So uh, what I wanted to uh, now ask is that uh, in, in the modern game uh, uh, recently, uh, uh, the, it, uh, it, it's always been like that, but uh, 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 the game models are constantly evolving to not even give even a inch of edge to the other team. Uh, earlier, we used to have some teams which are uh, good in transition, some teams which are good in one pace. Uh, these days, teams have to be excellent in every pace. Uh, uh, so you gave an answer that you evolved, you had a discussion and you changed your team from, uh, from a defensive midfielder to uh, more of a playmaker. So I wanted to just know about, uh, as a coach, your evolution of game model, like a brief history of your evolution of the game model and what is currently just an outline of your game model? Yeah, um, I think the important thing is with your game model, um, I always like, I came across a while ago, you know, people, some people will call it their footballing philosophy. I quite like, um, I think in Spain, it gets called your footballing idea as opposed to a philosophy, they call it their idea of football. And I like that way of sort of describing it and thinking about it. You know, what's your idea about the game? What, in an ideal world, if you could have everything you wanted, what would it look like? And that's sort of your starting point. But then when you come in, but that's not your game model, because I don't think anyone, if somebody tells me they've got a fixed game model, that is the same across any team, I wouldn't believe them. Because let's be honest, we, let's go to one of the top coaches. Um, now, can you Barcelona, Bayern Munich and Manchester City have the same game model? I don't think you can. They've all been, there's a difference across the three of them, but does Pep Guardiola have the same footballing idea <coughs> as he had 10, 15 years ago? I think the answer to that is yes. I think his idea about the game has never changed. But his application of that idea has had to be relevant to the footballing environment he finds himself in. So the application in Barcelona landed itself towards... You know, held up, you know, lots of passes. But when he went to Germany, that footballing idea had to be more aggressive. It had counter-attack culture. You know, the, the footballing culture of Germany is to break quickly from the defensive third, use the wingers, use attacking fullbacks. Um, and so he had to apply his footballing idea in the gerbil context and that has been the game when he comes into manchester city he's had to apply it in a different way so you know my footballing idea has always been you know when we don't have the ball we want to be very aggressive out of possession we want to be very positive in terms of don't defend backwards but defend forwards you know go to the ball and in possession we want to be in control of the ball but we want to play forward fast. We want to think forward, we want to look forward, and we want to play forward. That in my big picture is my footballing idea. How we apply that idea has evolved. It's not that it's evolved, it's been different in the different contexts. So to give you an example, um, out of possession. So we say about being aggressive and defending forward. Now, here in Uganda, we have a reasonably mobile front five and a reasonable so we are aggressiveness out of possession and we're going to ask our front five to really hunt the ball 
and we're going to ask our, our back four to press up, to, to press up, but we're going to allow them to be maybe halfway line minus five, minus 10 if we're pressing in the attacking half. So it's very much an aggressive, what you would consider a really classic aggressive press. Um, our front five were not as mobile like that, but our back four were very fast. They were very fast. And so in Rwanda, the application of our defend forward model was that we would lose the ball in the attacking half. And what we would say is, okay, we want our attacking midfielders to be plus 10 or plus 15 of the halfway line. But we want our back four to get as close to the halfway line as possible. So we almost compacted our entire team within a 15, 20 yard depth on the field. Now, were we chasing down the opposition in their, in their 30 meter defensive zone? No, because we knew they'd play through us. But our aggressiveness in defense came from we were going to really squeeze the midfield area. And basically what we were saying to our over the top, we, we needed them to do that because we knew that if they did that, we were quicker than them in defense. Field, so compact, but then we could be really aggressive in those, you know, 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s in the midfield zone. So both applications can be considered a defend forward aggressive mentality towards a defense but the application of them was very different because of the players we had available to us and and just the environment we find ourselves in so in philosophy or whatever you want Generally, and look, it might evolve over the years. I don't think mine has evolved massively. Um, I just think I've understood how to apply it better in different scenarios. So I think that's the key thing. It's, there's not one, one size fits all. I can't go to Asia and apply it in the same way I can here in East Africa. But the idea is the same, but how we apply it is going to be different. Uh, hi, Jonathan. I'm Janis. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. I just got the answer just I recently put in the message. Uh, it's very insightful. Thank you for your message. And then I want to question another one that it's a very difficult for us to make a drill. No? So as you said, you are very aggressive in defensive, like pressing. Uh, you want to do high pressure. So as a coach, how do you train the high pressure like like a uh, case? How we make a drill? Until now, we are yeah. copying the like YouTube books. So if I have to make my own drill, so what the consideration I have to make? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I think there's two sides to that. There's two parts to that answer. I think um, the first one I'll tackle is the idea of, you know, the pressure. How do you get people to press? And the second side of it is how to construct, you know, exercises or drills, as you called it. Um, first of all, you know, pressing is something that has to be in everything you do. Um, every training session, whether it's a little box possession, you know, 4v2, you know, to give you an example, if I was doing like a simple 4v2 possession exercise, um, what I would say is, okay, the four players are keeping the ball, they're moving it, you know, whether it's one or two touch, or it might even just be part of the warm up, you know, because we, we generally wouldn't use that as a main part of a session. But in, in sort of the early stages, you know, in the warm up, four versus two, and then what we'll say is if those two players in the middle manage to get onto the ball, it's not just about them winning the ball. They've got to break out of the area. So it might be whatever it is, an eight by eight box or a 10 by 10 box. So those two defensive players initially, as soon as they win the ball, they've got to try and dribble out of the box. So you might have passing targets that they're trying to pass to immediately. So that's now their counterattack moment. So not only are they in their out of possession moment, their defensive moment, but as soon as they win the ball, we've given them a way to counterattack. And then equally for those four guys who were initially playing one or two touch football possession, 
we're saying to them, the moment you lose the ball, do not let those two players get out of the box. You've got to immediately press. Um, and so if it's just a case of, if we've said to the two in the middle, you've got to dribble out of the box, well, then those four players, it's quite simple for their defensive transition moment. It's all mindset. It's right, we've lost the ball, bang, we need to get pressure on them immediately. If I want to then it, sort of advance that to you've got to press in the passing lane, that's when maybe I would put passing targets in. And so we've got this 4v2 exercise, but now as soon as the four have lost the ball, they've got to press, but they've also got to press whilst getting into the, the passing lane between the person on the ball and the target. And now you start to see that this becomes more game realistic so that now when we're in a game, say we're playing like a 6v6 or something and we lose the ball, now we've already started to condition the mindset of as soon as we've lost the ball, it's not like, oh, I've lost the ball, I'm disappointed. It's no next action, go and get the ball back. And also, because we're in a game, it's right, get the ball back, but also get into the passing lane, prevent them from playing forward. But that exists in everything we do. So, you know, literally the moment a team loses possession of the ball, doesn't matter whether it's in a little 4v2 possession exercise or it's something bigger, everything we have has a transition moment. You know, we might be playing attacking patterns. We might be working on our front five and how they pass and move the ball against a back four. So it might be might be five versus four, the five attacking players from the halfway line, the defensive unit against them and a goalkeeper. Now that session is largely about those five players, the patterns they're going to make, how are they going to create a goal scoring opportunity. But we have to give those four defenders targets that as soon as they win the ball, they're going to try and hit that target with a direct pass. Because now, even though 80% of that session, that exercise is about the attacking five players, their attacking patterns, the moment they lose the ball, it's always right. You've lost the ball. What do you do as soon as you lose the ball? You think counter press, you think get in the passing lane, you think apply pressure. Can you win the ball back? So everything we do has a transitionary moment. We never do anything where it's like, okay, attack, win the game, win the defense, win it, we start again. No, you've got to get the ball back. We'll allow at least one transition phase. And that just continually gets the idea of pressing into it. Um, I'm sorry, I've forgotten now the second question. I got so involved in the, in the how do you teach pressing. What was the second part of it? So how, how do you make a drill? Like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so a drill. Um, for me, it's funny. I've sort of, I've held off. A lot of people over the years have said to me, would I ever put a coaching book together in terms of exercises and stuff? And I've always been very hesitant to do so because I think how coaching books are put together is in a sense a little bit backwards. Um, if you think, if you pick up most coaching manuals, the first chapter is about the warm-ups, then it's about the possession, then it's about the phase of play, and then it gets to your tactics at the end. But actually, I think it should be in reverse. I think when you think about designing a training session, the best way I can describe this is, what do you want the final five minutes of your training to look like? Whether you're taking that to 11 v 11 with a senior side or you're taking it to 6 v 6 or 8 v 8 with a junior side, doesn't matter. What do you want the final five minutes to look like? And, and what do you want to see? What would you see in that final five minutes? And you think, yeah, that was a good session. And then what we do is we almost plant our flag into that moment in the game and we start walking backwards through our training session. So let's say, for example, we're doing building out of the back. You know, we're, we're, we're going to play 11 v 11 at the end and I want building out from my goalkeeper. So I know that the goalkeeper is going to interact with the, the center backs or the right back. And, and I can almost go, okay, 
moment of the game when the right back has the ball, who might he pass to, who might stop him from playing that pass. And then I can create, you know, I can say, okay, maybe it's the right back, the center back, the right winger, the number eight, the striker. And then in the opposition team, whoever's going to apply pressure. Now we've identified five or six players on each team. And I can say, okay, that happens, that act, that phase of play happens in maybe a 40 by 50 area of the field. Now I can start to see that I've created a small sided game. You know, I can drop the cones over that part of the field and I've created a small sided game that's very position specific. But now I want to go back further than that. I want to come into and say, okay, I want to create a passing exercise that, um, that replicates what he's going to have to do in this small-sided game. So I know my, my players are maybe going to receive the ball from their inside, so I want him maybe to be receiving you know, on the back foot and opening out, and can he hit a pass to a target within two touches? But then I also know that in the game he's going to have pressure coming from a certain angle, and so can I put an opponent in who's going to come and press the ball? And so now that player has time. You know, he, he now has to do his action with time restraints. The defender might make different decisions in terms of which passing lane he's going to block. Is he going to block the pass to the winger? Is he going to block the pass to the striker? So now as the right back's receiving the ball, he has to think, okay, I have to be aware of what my opponent's doing because that influences my choice of pass. But you can start to see that we're walking training back from the end point and we're, we're creating the training session. Um, like genuinely, I, I haven't bought, and look, this isn't because I coach a national team, but I watch training sessions all the time and I watch games all the time, but I genuinely haven't bought a, a football manual in a decade um, because I just look at it because the way you create a drill or an exercise should be grounded in your picture of that 11 v 11 or 9 v 9 game at the end of training. Because if it's not, if it's not relevant to that final destination and it's not linked up with your game model, then why are we doing it? You know, so it's, you know, and I know that's, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do, but I think just practicing it and, you know, always starting with the end in mind. What do I want the final five minutes of this training session to look like? And then walking back the exercises you're going to go in, through in training until you get to the simplest form, you know, the simplest form that you want to do. And then, you know, it makes sure that it's relevant. Um, but I also think you've got to think in anything you do, players have to be able to make decisions you know, I gave the example there of, you know, the right back, his passing practice, a technical practice for the right back. And I might only be working with two players there. You know, I might say, okay, it's me, the coach. I'm going to do an individual session with the right back. I want to work on my right back's passing into the final third. But in order to work on that effectively, I need at least one opponent. I might have three target goals that he's going to pass up, but I need that opponent because without that, without the opponent, there's no decision making for the right back. Because in a game, he has to decide, is he passing to the number seven, the number nine, the number 10? And that decision is linked into what his opponents are doing and what passes have they cut off. And so I think you always have to make sure any exercise you do, even right down to a technical one, still involves decision-making on the player's part. So I think... Yeah, thank you. That was great. <laughs> That's okay. So does anyone have any question? If you do not have, then I think we'll wrap up. If we have, I think it's been almost an hour. So uh, if anyone has any question, please go ahead. Okay, I think no one has any questions. So uh, on that note, I think uh, I'll thank first Jonathan for coming and taking out his time and you know addressing everyone and making this possible. And uh, thank you once again for coming. And yeah, I think that's it. Thank you everyone for coming and hopefully.
we can see you soon again in the future bye thank you yeah thank you very much guys it's thank been you. great thank you bye